say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. Happiness for husbands and wives. And how shall I begin? I think I'll read something we've been reading night after night out here. What the Lord said through the Apostle Paul concerning our day. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, I begin with verse 1, and I want you to listen. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers. Now I'm going to stop right there. But Paul lists 19 prevailing sins of the last days that will actually make those days perilous or dangerous. And amongst the sins he catalogs, truce breakers, people who will not keep their vows, who will not keep their promises, and without natural affection. It is unnatural for a man and a woman to be husband and wife and not continue in devotion one to the other. A rather long question came in tonight, rather late. And I tell you, my heart goes out to that person. And if in this message we don't answer that question somewhat, we'll then try to do it another time. Talking about a husband for whom she does everything she can think to do, and yet he is totally thoughtless of her and oblivious to her presence. How can it be? That's unnatural. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus looked down the stream of time to the last days. And it was Jesus who said in Matthew chapter 24, as it was in the days of Noah, when they were marrying and giving in marriage, when they were marrying for just any kind of reason and getting divorces for just any kind of reason, Christ said it will be like that just before the coming of the Son of Man. He also said, as it was in the days of Lot, and Lot lived in Sodom. And the word Sodomy has come down from that age and that town to suggest all that is illicit and sensual and salacious and filthy involving sex that is an abomination to God. Sodomy takes into consideration numerous kinds of perversion including lesbianism, homosexuality, which were the principal sins of Sodom. And for that reason, God destroyed those cities with fire. In our day, the statistic is alarming. One out of two marriages might end in divorce. My friends who have respect for God and His Word, may I assure you tonight, God never intended that it should be that way. Christ never intended that people should get married and then break up for just any kind of reason. God had only one thing in mind when he instituted marriage in the Garden of Eden. And by the way, God did it. 
And when people today put down marriage, they are insulting God with a most loathsome kind of contempt. I expect you to say amen to that. For it was God's idea. Now, if people say it's a stupid idea, they are calling God stupid. In Genesis chapter 2, you have the intimate story of the marriage of the first couple, our parents. The Bible created Adam first. And when Adam came alive, he looked around and the horse had his mare and the bull had his cow and the dog had his mate and every animal had a mate. Adam alone was by himself. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, God saw. Who saw? God saw that it was not good that man should be alone and therefore made the woman to be an help meet for him. Now that word does not mean help meet expenses. It comes from a Hebrew word which means someone to answer him. Someone to talk to him. I spend so much time in hotel rooms in far-flung places of the earth by myself that loneliness has become a companion to me. Tonight as we were driving over in the sunshine with the beautiful trees, I just had to tell my wife what a pleasure it is to be working in a place where we can both be together for a change. Somebody to answer. Someone to correspond with. A companion if you please. God said it's not good that man should be alone. And God made this woman, this beautiful creature. He caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep, the record says, and extracted from his side a rib. How many ribs? I didn't say one. I said A, and A means one. God didn't need but one rib because he only intended for that man to have one wife. How many wives? And God fashioned around that rib. God didn't need Adam's rib in order to make him a wife, but God wanted this intimate relationship to be so close that Adam could say after Eve was created, she is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, she's a part of me. And the woman could say, I am a part of him and he is a part of me. That's how God wants his couples to be in their relationship one to the other. And so God fashioned the beautiful and delicate form of Eve. And when she was ready, God awakened Adam and there she was in all her dazzling beauty. God had created a wife for Adam. And I might as well tell you, the first woman's liver was God. He created a wife to stand as an equal with Adam. Would you say amen out there? Or as one Christian writer puts it, God didn't take a bone out of Adam's head so that the woman could be above him and henpeck him. Nor did God take a bone out of Adam's foot so that he could trample upon her rights. But God took a bone from Adam's side indicating equality from under his arm indicating that he was to protect and provide for her and from near his heart indicating that he was to love her. And God presented to Adam a beautiful wife, and as soon as Adam saw her, he didn't say, Oh man, being married is a drag. This is a problem. Adam was so delighted with what God had done that he said, From this day forward, this shall be natural affection. A man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and the twain, twain means two, shall be one flesh. Adam said that. And when Jesus came many hundreds of years later, Christ said the same thing. Man shall leave father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. And incidentally, lots of marriages would get along better if they left father and mother. And some of these in-laws and outlaws would stop meddling. <laughs> But today the institution of marriage is under attack and people think it's smug and cute to belittle marriage nowadays. Let me give a commercial for marriage. It's still the best thing going. And the people who just shack up are a little ahead of dogs. Dogs shack up. And so do bears and monkeys and everything else. But we who are made in the image of God and who have the capacity to think and reason if we are intelligent, eventually come to the conclusion that man cannot go against God and be happy. 
Therefore, those who just shack up are insecure and scared. You read about it in their confessions from day to day. God's way is still the best way. It's the best thing going for the stability of the home, for the security of children, and for the dignity of man. And may I say something about dignity? It is more important what you think of yourself than it is what others think of you. And one reason people are so easily satisfied with the scum of the earth is because they don't think they deserve anything better. And the reason they don't think they deserve anything better is because they know that in those private hours they have cheapened their own per persons. They have blighted their own characters. They have violated their own consciences and have lost respect for themselves. That's why you young girls ought to make fellas keep their hands to themselves. Your body is sacred. You are somebody. And now the movie stars and the folk who grab the attention of the public are getting on television and looking straight into the camera and saying, Oh, we just live together. He's my lover. Like animals. And make no mistake about it, I'm not trying to be rough. I'm trying to tell the truth. They are like animals. And the thing that absolutely makes me disgusted is that so many clergymen today are joining in that kind of thing. Would I be out of order to tell you that to live that way is a sin and it is never right to sin? The institution of marriage was ordained of God, founded by Him to be a for the good of man. God said it's not good that man should be alone. And when he found it marriage, it was for man's good. Not to create a problem for man, but for his good and for the good of society. To be a blessing to the human race and to lift man above the status of an animal. And I want to tell you something tonight, beloved. No society has ever endured when it finally found only contempt for marriage and broke down the family institution. No society has ever endured that. You want to know why there's so much trouble in schools today? It's because of bad homes these young ones come from. You want to know why there's so much trouble in church? It's because these folk come out of torn up homes. And they are tense and uptight and they got to take it out on somebody. And since they can't take it out on their husbands, they take it out on the preacher. The home is the foundation of the school and the church and the community and society. And if you expect these to go well, then we need some homes that go well. Would you say amen out there? And so God instituted marriage in the Garden of Eden. And when Jesus came to the earth and began his public ministry, his first miracle was at a marriage feast in Cana of Galilee where he changed water into wine. Today, the devil has made such a, an attack on marriage that almost anything goes in its place. Common lawism, infidelity, adultery, philandering, and homes, instead of being little heavens on earth, have become arenas where people think they should meet to fight and cuss and cuss. Call one another profane names, and God is not pleased with that. Oh, beloved, please listen to me. The Bible says that God wants his people to be peculiar. Now, I've got sense enough to know that God's word isn't going to straighten out Washington, but it certainly ought to straighten out believers.